Well, it's a great uh, pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm very encouraged. Uh, all these students getting the Word of God, that's fantastic. Uh, I want to talk about the ultimate proof of creation this morning as we're doing uh, evangelism, as we're telling people about Jesus, which is what we want to be doing, of course, as Christians. There are objections that come to that. People will say, well, no, you can't, you can't trust the Bible because of X, Y, and Z. And apologetics is all about helping people over those stumbling blocks, showing them that they really can trust in the Bible, being ready to give an answer when people ask you for, for the reason for the hope that's in you. And we need to do that, of course, with gentleness and respect. And so one, one of the main objections that people have to the Bible is creation. That's the one where you know, people will say, well, you can't trust the Bible because we know that six days of creation, that's not possible. We know millions of years of evolution, that's the way that life came about. And what we do at the Institute for Creation Research is we, is we expose the absurdity of evolution and showing how, how good science, when you understand the science, it actually confirms what the Bible teaches very strongly. And, and I'm very encouraged to get to work and oversee the research at ICR. I get to work with a number of different uh, brilliant scholars there who do research in genetics and, and, uh, and, and other aspects of biology and geology and physics and so on. And my specialty, astrophysics, which deals with outer space and things of that nature. It's a lot of fun, and I enjoy showing how God's glory is revealed in science when you understand it. It's, it's such a shame that people have taken science and, and perverted it and tried to use it to, to go against God. But science is only possible because of God, because the universe is orderly and so on. And that's what I want to show you today. I want to show you an ultimate proof of creation. Why creation? This is one of the most attacked aspects of God's word. And it's one that it's helpful for us to know a little bit of the basics of science. I'm not going to concentrate too much on that today. But I want to give you an argument that you can use. Because people say, well, you know, is there one, is there one argument that I can kind of specialize in? Because I don't have time to study genetics and, all the, and, and geology and all these different things. And, of course, nobody can be an expert on everything. No, nobody can be other than God. He doesn't need to do apologetics. But, uh, um, you know, is there one argument that I can specialize in that just refutes evolution? And the answer is yes, there is. And I'm going to give that to you today. There is an ultimate proof of creation. And that separates me from some Christians, I, I understand, who say, well, no, you can't prove the Bible. I think you can. I think you can, you can objectively demonstrate that creation is true. And, and I'm not going to just be arguing for creation. I'm going to be arguing for the Christian worldview as a whole. I'm going to be showing you that the Bible has to be true in its entirety. And, uh, when you make, and when you use this argument that I'm going to give you today, you need to be prepared because people that you're using this argument, you know, as you're sharing this with other people, they may or may not be persuaded by it. Okay, they, I mean, they might be. They might say, you got me there. I've, I've got to be a consistent Christian now. I've got to believe in biblical creation. But they might not say that. They might, well, I'm not persuaded. Okay, and, and you shouldn't be intimidated by that. You shouldn't think, well, if you're not persuaded, maybe the argument's not good. No, people sometimes are not persuaded by a very good argument. That doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with the argument, right? An argument can be perfectly logical and absolutely conclusive, and people will still reject it because people are not always logical. And that's especially true of unbelievers who, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They don't want to believe in God. And so don't, don't, don't be intimidated if they're not persuaded. You're, it's not your job to persuade people in an ultimate sense. That's up to God. God brings persuasion in an ultimate sense. It's your job to give a defense. And I've got a great one that I'm going to share with you today. It's really good. And, uh, and there will, I can guarantee you this, there will be no comeback. Oh, yeah, I mean, words might come out of their mouth, but they won't, there won't be any logical objection to what I'm going to say today, okay? And I, I guarantee you that. I've been doing this for years. I've never had anybody be able to come back from it. Just keep in mind, it's not your job to persuade. It's your job to give a defense. And if you give a good defense, then you should walk away happy, regardless of what happens. It's up to God whether or not that person converts. That's up to him. Only God can open people's eyes. Some people say, well, if you can give an ultimate proof of creation, then do we need faith? The answer is yes, because faith is when you have confidence in something that you have not perceived with your senses. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that. And I have confidence in biblical creation because it's objectively provable, you see, and yet it's not something I can see with my senses. It is faith. It is faith in, the, in a biblical sort. It's just an objectively provable one. People have misconceptions of faith. They think faith is when you believe in something that you can't prove. 
That's not the right definition. That's not the biblical definition. It's having confidence in something you cannot perceive with your senses. Now, I want to start by mentioning a few lines of scientific evidence that people use sometimes to show that creation's true. And, uh, and then I want to show you why these are not quite ultimate. They're good lines of evidence, but they're not an ultimate proof, so that I can then show you how the ultimate proof is different. Does that sort of make sense? One, one of the lines of evidence that creationists often use uh, concerns the fact that um, information never originates by itself in matter. Right? Like when you find a book and it's got creative information in it, or you can read it and it makes sense, you know that that didn't just come from an explosion in a typewriter. You know that somebody wrote the book, right? And then it might be a copy of a copy of a copy, but somebody originated that information in the book. The, pr the process of copying the book can't add new information. I mean, it might accidentally duplicate a paragraph, but that, that wouldn't add any new information. The copying process can at best lose information or, or at very best keep it the same. It can't add new information. That's a law of nature. It's a law of nature that information always goes back to a mind, a mental source. And in DNA, what do we have? Information. The, you see, inside the cells of your body is a long molecule, DNA, and it has on these, the rungs of this ladder, uh, nucleotide base pairs, and those are basically the instructions to make you. It's really uh, impressive, it's remarkable. We think we can get, oh yeah, we can get all this information on a Blu-ray, aren't we clever? God put the information to make you on a molecule. That's awesome. <laughs> it really is. But see, the fact that you, got, you have this information, where did you get the information in your DNA? Well, you got it from your parents, and they got it from their parents, and they got it from their parents, all the way back to Adam and Eve, and they got it from God. The information comes from a mind. You see, creation's consistent with the, the laws of nature as we understand them, but evolution isn't, because in evolution, the, you're supposed to gradually increase the information over millions of years, and that's not what we observe. In fact, mutations don't help. They might, mutations sometimes do help an organism survive, but only by losing information. They never generate new information. Uh, Dr. Lee Spetner, world expert on mutations, says all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information, not to increase it. He says not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. And so you see information science, genetics, they confirm creation. They do not confirm millions of years of evolution. That's pretty good science, isn't it? That's pretty good evidence. We could talk about the age of the earth. The Bible's clear that God created in six days. It's clear from context. Those are ordinary, approximately 24-hour days. There's no doubt about that when you understand the Hebrew language and so on. I know people try and stretch those out, but that doesn't work grammatically. But, you know, there's a lot of science that confirms that the world is only thousands of years old, not anywhere near millions or billions. One of the ones that I like to use because it's so powerful is the fact that we find C14 in diamonds. C14 is an unstable isotope of carbon. Most carbon is C12, and you're made of lots of carbon, but there's a small fraction of it that's C14, and C14 is unstable, which means it will decay into nitrogen, spontaneously change into nitrogen with the half-life of about 5,700 years. That's about how long it lasts. And so the fact that we have diamonds that still have C14 in them means they can't be anywhere near the billions of years old that, that secularists like to believe. And they'd say, well, well there's some, somehow new C14 got in there. How? It's a diamond. It's the hardest naturally occurring substance. So there's no way you can get new C14 in there. Obviously, when these things formed, it was, it was not millions of years ago, but thousands. Otherwise, the C14 would be gone. That's compelling evidence, in my mind, for a young Earth. Very compelling. Not billions of years. Comets. Uh, comets are made up of ice and dirt, and they orbit in kind of elliptical paths, they go far away from the sun and then they come close and they kind of whiplash back out. And when they're far away, the ice remains frozen, but when they come close to the sun, that ice gets uh, vaporized, right? It actually uh, sublimes and goes, goes out into space. And in fact, that's what a comet's tail is. A comet's tail is material that's being blasted away from the nucleus of a comet by solar heat and radiation. So every time you see a comet, it's getting smaller, it's losing mass. And we know how much mass is there, and, we, and we, can, we can see the rate at which it's leaving, we can measure that, which, which means you can estimate the maximum lifetime of a comet at about 100,000 years. Any older than that, and it'd be gone. Now, here's the problem in the secular view. We've got plenty of comets in the solar system. So if the solar system really were 4.5 billion years old, as secularists believe, there should be no comets left. They should all be totally, they should be gone. Even if the solar system were 1 million years old, the comets would be gone by now. I have seen comets go behind the sun and be destroyed in one pass. There are some comets that I've seen that no longer exist because they've been destroyed. They just don't last that long, okay? 
And uh, I, I used the uh, SOHO spacecraft in my doctoral dissertation, and it, it, it's able to look at the sun, and it's able to see comets as they get really close to the sun. And I've seen ones that have gone behind the sun, and then they're, that's it, no more comet. So they don't last anywhere near millions of years. Now, these are all good lines of evidence, and I have many others that I present in, in some of my other talks. But these are not quite an ultimate proof of creation because for every line of evidence that I've presented, an evolutionist can always invoke what we might call a rescuing device. Now, a rescuing device is a hypothesis that kind of protects your, your way of thinking, your belief, from what appears to be contrary evidence. And so in the case of comets, my secular colleagues know very well that comets can't last billions of years. They can do the same math I can do. They can calculate the rate at which the material's depleted and so on. They know that comets can't last millions of years. And so they say, well, there must be a, a comet generator that makes new ones, which they call the Oort cloud. If you ever heard of the Oort cloud, the idea is that there is a vast reservoir of, let's call them potential comets, out beyond the farthest planets. We can't see it because they're too far away. All right? And every now and then, one of them is dislodged from this cloud and thrown into the inner solar system and becomes a brand new comet. And so the idea is as old comets are depleted, new comets replace them. And so the solar system can be billions of years old after all. How about that? That's their claim. Now, if I were to ask a secular astronomer, is there any observational evidence of an Oort cloud? If he's honest, he'll say, well, no. And if he's clever, he'll say, but you can't prove it's not there. And that's true. I can't disprove the existence of an undetectable Oort cloud. It's undetectable. How am I supposed to disprove that, right? <laughs> you see, for every line of evidence, scientific evidence that you can present, there will always be a rescuing device if there's a clever person. And so you say, well, there's information in DNA. That never comes about by chance. The secularists could say, oh, well, as far as we know, but there could be some undiscovered process that generates that information. We just haven't discovered it yet. Give us time. We'll find it. Or you know, I present, you know, is there C14 in diamonds? Well, there's some kind of contamination. There's some kind of process that generates new C14 in diamonds. We don't know what it would be, but give us time. We'll find it. Or, you know, comets, they, you know, they, they can't last millions of years. No problem. There's an Oort cloud that makes new ones. You see, for every line of evidence you can present, there's always a rescuing device. And the reason for that is because we all have a worldview. We have a way of thinking about things that helps us understand what the evidence means. And so I look at the world in my uh, creation viewpoint, and I say comets, and I say, yeah, young solar system. My secular colleague looks at the same solar system, the same comets, and he says, well, there must be an Oort cloud that makes new ones, because we know it's billions of years old. Okay? We all have a way of thinking about things, and that affects how we understand the evidence. People think that the way that you solve the origins debate is you get more facts on your side. And that's not right, because creationists and evolutionists have the same facts. We do. We have, I have access to the same uh, genetic patterns, DNA structures, as my secular colleagues. I have access to the same fossils. I look at the same stars and galaxies they do. That's not the problem. Well, we, well, we do science differently. No, we do science pretty much the same way in terms of science in the present, right? I mean, I, I do physics and chemistry the same as my secular colleagues. We do science pretty much the same way. We have the same science. Why do we come to different conclusions about how the world came into existence? Because we have a different worldview. A worldview is the way of, th your way of thinking about things. You can think of that kind of like mental glasses. Now, only some of us wear glasses physically, but we all wear mental glasses, and that kind of affects how we think about the world, how we see the world. And I, think the, I like to think of the Bible like corrective lenses that are designed just for you because they give you the correct view of history, right? And those of you that, that wear glasses, you know that in order to see the world correctly, you need to put those glasses on. And when you do that, everything becomes clear and you see the world as it really is. I like to think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses and you'll say, well, the world is red. Well, it's not red, that's, but that's what you see because those glasses have colored your view of the world. Now, I realize, of course, evolutionists will say, no, we're wearing the right glasses, you're wearing the wrong glasses, and we're going to have to argue for that. But my point here is simply that we all wear mental glasses. We all have a way of thinking about things. Our worldview, which consists of what are called presuppositions. Presuppositions are your most basic beliefs about reality. They're the rules of interpretation that you assume at the outset before you investigate the evidence. There are some things that you believe already when you come to evidence. You see, a lot, of, a lot of times people are taught that science is just totally objective, right? That you're supposed to be neutral when you come to the evidence. But the fact is you can't be. You can't be. 
Uh, for example, when you come to a rock on the side of the road, and you say, I'm going to do an experiment on that rock and find out it's, what it's made of, its composition, and so on, and I'm going to be totally objective and neutral. I'm not going to make any assumptions. Well, you've already made some assumptions. You've already assumed that the rock is there because you see it. You've assumed that your senses are basically reliable. Now, that's a presupposition. You're, you're assuming that you're not just a brain in a jar or like in the matrix where you're just being fed information, right? And this is all illusion. You've assumed that it's really there because you can see it. Now, that is a presupposition. Now, I happen to think that's a correct presupposition, but it is a presupposition. It's something you believe before you come to the evidence. So the basic reliability of your senses is a presupposition. The reliability of your memory is a presupposition. How do you know that what you remember actually happened? How do you know that your memory is basically reliable? He said, well, I know that, Dr. Lau, because I took a test two weeks ago. It was a memory test, and I got an A on it. I, I, so I got a great memory. And, I, I, of course, I'm going to ask, how do you know that you took a memory test two weeks ago? <laughs> right? Well, I remember taking it. But, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You see, you'd have to already assume that your memory is reliable in order to argue that you correctly remember that your memory is reliable. <laughs> That's the nature of a presupposition. You can't escape that. Laws of logic are a presupposition. These laws by which we reason, like the law of non-contradiction, if I said my car is in the parking lot and it's not in the parking lot, I hope you wouldn't rush out to see that. Say, yeah, wow, I want to see a car that's there and not there. <laughs> right? that doesn't, you know, it's a law of logic. But how, can you prove that there are laws of logic? I think you can, but not without using them, right? Because you're going to need laws of logic to make any kind of proof that there are laws of logic. That's the nature of a presupposition. You can't escape that. Now, some people might say, oh, not me. I don't have these beliefs about how to interpret evidence. I believe evidence ought to be interpreted neutrally. And I'm going to say, well, that's a very interesting belief, isn't it? See, the belief that evidence should be interpreted neutrally is a belief about how to interpret evidence. It's a bad one because it's self-refuting, but it is a belief. You can't escape that. You cannot escape having presuppositions. The key is to have correct presuppositions, okay? And that's the difference between creationists and evolutionists. The creationists, because we stand on the authority of God's word, we have correct presuppositions to the extent that we're, that we're in agreement with Scripture, and then the evolutionists do not have correct presuppositions. And what we need to do is expose that. We need to point out that their presuppositions are wrong. That's the biblical way to approach this issue. You can think of presuppositions a little bit like kidneys. You see, most people are not aware of their own kidneys. Have you ever thought about that? You don't th until I mentioned it, you probably weren't thinking about how your kidneys are working and anything like that, right? It's just something you take for granted. But you need kidneys to live, right? You need kidneys to live because they, they're, they're vital to your survival. But most people are not aware of their own. Presuppositions are like that. They are essential to your ability to understand the universe, and yet most people have never thought about them. They've never really given it the time of day. What we want to do, you see, is make the evolutionist aware that his presuppositions are wrong. What we want to do is give him the intellectual equivalent of a kidney stone, okay? <laughs> We want to give him some information that his presuppositions cannot process. And then he's suddenly going to become very aware that something is wrong with his presuppositions. Let me tell you, if you have a kidney stone, you're suddenly very aware of your own kidneys. And you're aware that something is wrong with them. Okay, that's what we want to do. Now, you see, the kicker is creationists and evolutionists have competing worldviews. We have different ways of thinking about the world in which we live. We have different standards. Your worldview is all of your presuppositions together, okay? So I'm going to use those interchangeably. Your worldview, your presuppositions, same thing. And we have different presuppositions, different rules for interpreting the evidence. That's why creationists and evolutionists can look at exactly the same fossil and come to very different conclusions about what it means. They have different way of thinking about things, a different standard. And, and by the way, presuppositions are hierarchical. Some are more basic than others. There's some presuppositions you, you hold, well, actually all presuppositions you hold too tightly, but some more tightly than others, and they will boil down to an ultimate standard. There's, one, there's at least one, there's one presupposition you have that is more basic than all others, and for the creationists, that should be the Bible. I'm not saying it is for all creationists, I'm just saying it should be for all creationists. I mean, if, the, if this really is the authoritative word of God, the God who knows everything is incapable of error and never lies... Wouldn't it be ridiculous to start with anything else as your presupposition? We have absolute truth right here in what the Bible affirms. 
So that makes sense to start with the Bible as our ultimate presupposition. Now, I do have secondary standards, of course. I do believe that my senses are basically reliable. But that's not my ultimate standard because I know my senses can be fooled. Have you ever seen an optical illusion? Something that you, you know, your eyes are telling you that it's there, but it's not? I have, I have a little device that generates a virtual image of anything you put inside of it on, on top. It's really neat. You can, see, you can put something there, but you can stick your finger right through it. Now, now what do you do? You've got one sense telling you it's there, your sight. You've got another sense telling you it's not there. What do you do? They can't both be right. And you see, you've got a greater presupposition that tells you how to interpret those. The Bible is my ultimate presupposition, my ultimate standard. Now, for the evolutionist, generally, the ultimate standard is either naturalism or strict empiricism. Naturalism is the belief that nature is all that there is, and therefore there can't be any miracles. There's no God, or if there is, he's within the universe and doesn't actually do anything. Okay, so that's, that's naturalism. Everything that exists is within nature. Now, I reject that view because there's God who is beyond nature. Or strict empiricism, which is the belief that all truth claims are answered by observations. If you want to know something, you've got to go out and look and see it with your eyes and touch it and so on. That's how all knowledge is obtained. Now, of course, I do think some knowledge is obtained that way. Don't get me wrong. We can learn some things from our senses. But I don't believe everything is learned by experience. You can't know about life after death from experience, right? We need somebody to tell us about that. And, uh, of course, God is the only one who's in a position to do that. So... Here's the problem with the way most people argue. Most people use what's called an evidential approach to apologetics, an evidential approach or a classical approach, and there's a problem with that. And don't get me wrong, it's fine to show people evidence, that's okay. But if you think that that decides the issue of creation versus evolution, it doesn't, right? And the reason is because evidence by itself is never decisive when it comes to a worldview issue. You can't change somebody's worldview just by presenting evidence because the person's worldview tells them what to make of the evidence. And I have a, a silly illustration I like to use to, to uh, demonstrate this. There was a man who, who thought that he himself was dead. He thought that he was dead. And he's very upset about this. He doesn't like being dead. Who would? And his doctor says, you know, that's a very strange issue. He says, of course you're not dead. You're walking and talking. And the man says, yes, but you know, bodies can have muscle spasms even after clinical death. That could explain my ability to walk and talk. And the doctor says, okay, but I've got medical charts showing you you're perfectly healthy. I did some tests on you. He says, yeah, but maybe the name got swapped on the chart. That might not even be my chart. And the doctor says, I'm getting very frustrated. Okay, I'm going to prove to you that you're not dead. Do dead men bleed? And the guy thinks about it for a second. Well, the circulatory system would be stopped. No, dead men don't bleed. And the doctor very quickly takes a little pin, pricks the guy in the hand. Sure enough, a little blood comes to the surface. See, you're bleeding. To which the man responds, well, how about that? I guess dead men do bleed. <laughs> Silly example, I know, but it makes the point, doesn't it? Did the doctor have good evidence for his position? Of course. The guy could walk and talk. There were medical charts. The guy could bleed. Those are good lines of evidence that he's alive. But you see, this man was always able to come up with a rescuing device to explain away those evidences in light of his presupposition that he himself was dead. He was willing to trade in other beliefs to protect his main belief, his presupposition that he was dead. You see, so you see, that's what's going to happen. You're going to find that that is the case when you just throw evidence at evolutionists and expect them to change their mind. They're, they're probably not. They're probably going to give up these other beliefs to protect their, their belief in evolution. And so you might have great evidence for creation. Yes, I think fossils are great evidence for creation. And the, the fact that there was a worldwide flood, what would we expect to find? We'd expect to find all kinds of bones of dead animals all over the world on all continents on a global scale. And that's exactly what we find. This is exactly what we find. It's confirmation of Genesis. But you see, I'm looking at it properly through the lens of Scripture. My secular colleague is going to look at that same fossil and he's going to say, that's not how I see it. I think that, he says, I think fossils were deposited gradually over millions of years and that maybe that's a transitional form and so on. And, you know, we're inclined to think, well, yeah, yeah I guess you could look at it that way. So maybe that evidence wasn't as good as I thought. Um, so we try different evidence, right? We say, but look... Canyons can form quickly. Mount St. Helens demonstrated that. He says, well, that's not how I see it. Just because one canyon formed quickly doesn't mean the Grand Canyon did. We know that took millions of years. We say, well, I guess it doesn't prove it. But rock layers can be deposited quickly. Mount St. Helens demonstrated that as well. It doesn't take millions of years. And the guy says, yeah, but just because those rocks were deposited quickly doesn't mean these rocks were. We say, well, yeah, I guess that's true. It's not definitive. Uh, animals, though, animals always reproduce according to their kinds. 
right? They, don't, they, don't, they never give rise to another kind, like evolution insists. And he says, well, sure, today, but given enough time, given millions of years, one kind will change into another. We just haven't been around long enough to see that. Oh, but look, we, there's evidence in DNA. DNA has information in it that never comes about by chance. He says, yeah, but there could be some unknown process that generates that information. You see where I'm going here? Oh, oh well, out in outer space, we have things like comets that can't last billions of years. He says, no problem, there's an Oort cloud that makes new ones. You see, you see what happens there? And, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't use evidence. I think you should do some of this. I think it's important to show people that there is a biblical way of understanding the evidence. I spoke at a secular college last night, and that's kind of what I did. I showed them that there's a biblical way to, uh, to see the evidence. That opens the door to get them thinking. But my point is, that by itself is not conclusive, is it? Because you can look at it either way. I haven't demonstrated that my way is the right way to look at the evidence. I've just shown them that there is another way to look at it. And there's some value in that, don't get me wrong. My point is that evidence by itself will not persuade a philosophically astute person because he'll always come up with a rescuing device to protect his worldview. So it's good to show people evidence, don't get me wrong, and how the Bible makes sense of it. But this by itself will not resolve a debate over worldviews because a person's worldview tells him how to interpret the evidence. It's hard for us to get this into our minds. And I think the reason for that is we tend to spend most of our time with people that have the same worldview that we do. Okay, if I'm arguing with a, a fellow Christian about whether or not there are crackers in the cupboard, we could settle that by going and up, opening up the cupboard and seeing, well, there are crackers there. And we agree that our senses are reliable, and so we, we come to agreement just by presenting evidence. You can do that if you have the same worldview. If I'm arguing with a Hindu who says, well, the world is all illusion, it's all maya, and, I, and we have a disagreement about crackers in the cupboard, and I see, there they are. Is that going to convince him? No, because he's going to say, well, that's illusion too. He has a different worldview. When people have a different worldview, you have to use a different method of debating with them. You have to use one that deals with that worldview. What we need to do is show that the Christian worldview is the right worldview. Now, how do we do that? Before I give you the right answer, I want to give you the wrong answer, because most people will give this response. They'll say, well, what we can do, and it's usually the seculars that propose this, right? I mean, we have this disagreement. I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions, my secular colleague standing on his secular presuppositions, and so we're interpreting evidence differently. Each of us thinking it confirms our worldview. Can't just throw evidence at each other. That won't work. We've seen that. So often the secularist will propose this. He'll say, well, you know what? Let's meet on neutral ground. Let's, let's give up the presuppositions that we don't agree on. And there's some things we, we have to agree on, right? There's some, certainly some neutral presuppositions. And we'll meet kind of in the middle. So, and we'll give up the presuppositions we don't agree on. And he says, and I certainly don't agree that the Bible is the word of God. I don't believe that. So you have to leave the Bible out of the conversation. That's what a lot of people say. And to, that, to a lot of Christians, that seems reasonable. But it's a trap. First of all, what does the Bible have to say about neutral ground? No such thing. Jesus says in Matthew 12, 30, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. There's no neutral ground there. Uh, Romans 8, 7, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. But see, when, when, you're, when you're thinking in a way that's inconsistent with God, you're not neutral. You're hostile to God. Uh, James 4, 4, you adulterers says, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, there's no neutral ground. You're either God's friend or his enemy. You're either with him or you're against him. You're gathering or you're scattering. There is no neutral. And so we need to remember this, that the attempt to be neutral is a fallacy. We're going to call it the pretended neutrality fallacy, as Dr. Bonson uh, liked to put it. Since the Bible indicates that there is no neutral, the claim of neutrality is unbiblical. Now, now follow my logic here, right? Because the, Bi the Bible says there's no neutral. So if somebody comes along and says, oh, yes, there is neutral, and I'm neutral, well, they've just said the Bible's wrong, in which case they're not being neutral. They've already decided the Bible's an error. You see that? In, in claiming to be neutral, they've already made a non-neutral stand. That's something we need to understand. And by the way, you will have to explain that to people. <laughs> you will. So make sure you have that yourself. Neutrality is a non-neutral position because it's anti-biblical. The Bible says there's no such thing. So when the secularist says, yeah, let's meet on neutral ground somewhere in the middle, and Christians say, okay, we can leave the Bible out of the discussion. No, because neutral ground is actually secular ground. The Bible says there's no such thing. The Bible doesn't make allowance for neutrality when it comes to an ultimate standard. You're either with God or you're against him. 
And so when you step onto so-called neutral ground, that's secular ground, and at that point, you've pretty well lost the debate. Because isn't, isn't the debate, creation versus evolution, isn't that really about whether or not this is true? That's really what it's about. And you've started the debate by saying, this isn't true, at least about neutrality. It's wrong. Now, how do you think that debate's going to go when you've immediately conceded defeat in the first step? Not very well. <laughs> You can't defend biblical authority by immediately abandoning biblical authority in the first step. That's not logical. It's not rational at all. Evolutionists like to think they're very neutral and objective. And you're going to have to point out to them that in believing that, they've already decided the Bible's wrong, in which case they're not being neutral. They like to think they're very neutral. They're going to want you to be neutral too. Two things you need to remember when people ask you to be neutral. One, they're not. Two, you shouldn't be. Okay? <laughs> no one is neutral when it comes to an ultimate standard, and you shouldn't try to be. We're not called to be neutral. We're called to be Christians, and we're supposed to stand on the authority of God's Word. And they'll say, well, you can't do that. That's circular reasoning. Well, actually, the Bible tells us we're to stand on God's Word, even, even to refute those who contradict. We're supposed to stand on the authority of His Word. They'll say, well, that's circular reasoning. You can't stand on what you're trying to defend. Uh, why not? In battle, you can stand on a hill while you're defending the hill, right? That's the best place to be. Have you ever had something in your eye and you go to a mirror and you can use your eye to examine your eye and even correct your eye? There's nothing illogical about that. And by the way, the evolutionist stands on evolution while defending it. It's on the same thing, right? So don't give in to this neutrality myth. Okay, what's the answer then? How, how is it that we give this ultimate proof of creation? We can't just throw evidence at each other. That's not the solution because we're going to each interpret that evidence according to our respective presuppositions. We can't meet on neutral ground because there's no such thing. The key is to recognize that biblical presuppositions and only biblical presuppositions make knowledge possible. That's a different kind of an argument. If you haven't heard this type of presentation before, that might seem a little strange at first, but let, uh, let me walk you through this here. And, and by the way, I know this is good because it's something the Bible teaches. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to begin to know anything, it starts with God. A fear of the Lord, which means a reverential submission to His presuppositions. Biblical presuppositions and only biblical presuppositions make it possible for us to know anything about anything. And again, most people haven't thought about this. But we need to think through some of these issues. In Christ, the Bible says, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not some, all. You see, God is the source of all knowledge, and we are the recipients of some of God's knowledge by God's revelation to us, ultimately. Now, you might say, but wait a minute, Dr. Lau, you're telling me the Bible has to be true in order for us to know anything? Yes. But, but I have some friends who are not Christians, and they know some things. Yes, they do, because the Bible's true. The fact that they don't believe it is not relevant. He said, well, how is it that they're able to know things without relying on biblical presuppositions? And the answer is they do rely on biblical presuppositions. Yes, unbelievers do rely on biblical presuppositions. They just deny it. And the Bible tells us that. How is it that they're able to rely on these biblical presuppositions and then turn around and deny them? They're able to rely on them because they're made in the image of God too, and they know God. But then they suppress that truth in unrighteousness. The Bible tells us this very clearly in Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They hold back the truth. They suppress it in unrighteousness. So they know, they know God exists. They know he's angry at them for their sins. But then they suppress that and say, no, we don't, we don't know that. We don't even believe in God. Well, of course they do. Because God's made himself known to them. Verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. You see, God has made himself evident to everyone, even those who hate him and rebel against him. And uh, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So God, God has hardwired us so that when we think about anything, when we look in nature and we see everything, we, we immediately understand that God made it. God has hardwired us to to. to God is hardwired a knowledge of him into us so that we all know God, so that they are without excuse. It's interesting the way that's worded in Greek. It's an apologia, without an apologetic. Isn't that interesting? You see, we do apologetics by realizing that unbelievers have none. They have no apologetic. 
You realize that? They cannot defend their position rationally. So what it comes down to is this. Only the Bible can make sense of those things necessary for knowledge. And I know this is a little abstract, but, but stay with me here. What I'm going to show you is that we know the Bible has to be true because if it weren't, you couldn't know that anything is true. You mean I couldn't know that the sky is blue? Correct. You could not know that the sky is blue if the Bible were not true. Think about it. How do you know that the sky is blue? You say, well, I go out and I see it and it's, it's blue. Well, you've assumed that your senses are basically reliable, that your eyes are truthfully reporting you what's happening in the universe. But how do you, how do you know that your eyes are reliable? Now, if you're a Christian, you can, you can say, yeah, well, because God created my senses and God is not the author of deception or confusion, right? And so I would expect my senses would work basically truthfully. Now, of course, there's the sin and the curse, and so maybe not 100% of the time, but nonetheless, my senses are basically reliable. But you see, if my eyes are just the result of mutations over millions of years, there's no reason to think that they're truthful. If evolution's true, you couldn't know that the sky is blue because you have no reason to trust that your eyes are honest. You see? Let me give you some other examples of this. There are... Uh, three basic categories that I like to kind of specialize in. Things that we take for granted, things that make knowledge possible, that only make sense if the Bible's true. One of them is uh, laws of logic. Again, like the law of non-contradiction, which says you can't have A and not A at the same time in the same relationship. Again, if I said my car's in the parking lot, and it's not the case that my car's in the parking lot, you wouldn't for a moment believe that, I hope. You wouldn't rush out and say, oh, I like to see a car that's there and not there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe that because you know that that can't be. There's a law of logic that says that's impossible, okay? Have you ever thought about why that law of logic exists? The law of non-contradiction is rooted in the nature of God. The reason that truth can never contradict truth is because, one, all truth is in God, and two, God cannot deny himself. The Bible tells us that. God can't go against himself, and since all truth is in God, truth can't go against truth. Truth cannot contradict. And I know that that rule will apply everywhere in the universe. Why? Because God is sovereign over the entire universe. I know that rule, the, the law of non-contradiction will be true at all times. Why? Because God is timeless. He's beyond time. His thoughts always control reality, you see. I know there's not going to be any exceptions to that rule because God is sovereign over everything. You see? I can make sense of the law of non-contradiction. But in a chance universe, why would there be laws of logic at all? Ever thought about that? And how could you possibly know about them? How do you know, if you, if, uh, uh, putting the Bible aside for the sake of argument, how do, how, and you ask a secularist, how do you know that there's a law of non-contradiction and that it's always true? He won't be able to answer that. You say, well, I've, I've never seen it be wrong. Well, I've never seen Antarctica. Does that mean Antarctica doesn't exist? No. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's... That it's uh, just because you haven't seen it violated doesn't mean it's never violated. You see, the secularist relies on the law of non-contradiction, but he doesn't have any reason for it on his own professed worldview. He's stealing from the Christian worldview to support his own. Isn't that interesting? Or uniformity in nature, which is what allows science to take place. The fact that there are patterns in nature that are sort of uniform. And, and granted, God's not required to do it that way, but he does uphold the universe in a consistent way most of the time for our benefit. And he's promised to, to do that in passages like Genesis 8.22 where it tells us the basic cycles of nature will be in the future as they have been in the past. All scientists rely on that principle, but it is a biblical principle. And it's one you couldn't possibly know if the Bible weren't true. How do you know that there are laws of nature and that they remain constant over time? You can't know that apart from Scripture. You can say, well, I've experienced that. Well, how do you know you've experienced it? Because your brain, your memory, relies on constancy of laws of nature. If they're not constant, you can't rely on your memory. And so you couldn't know that they've been constant, and you, can't, you certainly can't know anything about the future in the secular worldview, right? Because we haven't experienced it. Now, in the Christian worldview, I can say, no, I know in the future that laws of logic and laws of nature will continue to be as they were because God is beyond time, you see. And he's promised me that as long as the earth remains, these cycles in nature will continue, again, in Genesis 8.22. Those are kind of abstract, I know. People haven't thought about those, but people have thought about morality. And so if this is the first time you've heard something like this, I would encourage you to really give thought to morality. That's the one I'm going to kind of focus in on. Because people haven't thought about laws of logic or why there's uniformity in nature, but they have thought about right and wrong. But do you realize that in an atheistic universe, you can't have objective right and wrong? There's no such thing. In an objective universe, what happens simply happens. There's no right or wrong about it. 
It's just molecules in motion. We're just sacks of chemistry interacting with other sacks of chemistry. Why would there be anything fundamentally wrong or right about that? Now, in the Christian worldview, I can make sense of objective right and wrong. Right is what corresponds to God's approval. When you do something that's right, it's something that God approves of, and he blesses you for it. And wrong is, what some, is something that goes against God's approval, something that he condemns. And it's the, and it's the same for everybody because God's sovereign over all of us. I can make sense of objective morality. So these things that we all take for granted that make knowledge possible, knowledge of logic, knowledge of science, knowledge of ethics, you couldn't have those apart from the Bible being true. Now, my point is not that secularists don't believe in these things. My point is they do, and yet on their own professed worldview, there's no reason for them to. So the, the atheist says, but, but I believe in objective morality. I say, well, on your worldview, you shouldn't. You're just a bag of chemistry on your worldview. Why would you care what one bag of chemistry does to another bag of chemistry, right? That doesn't make any sense. You might think, is it that easy? Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it really is. And, uh, in fact, if you look on my blog or on my public Facebook page, I've had conversations with secularists on this issue, and they just can't answer it. You see, they're, they're made in God's image. They can't escape that. But um, they can't explain on their own worldview how knowledge is possible. We need to look at it this way. At first, it might seem like there's no way we can debate the issue because I'm standing on my biblical presuppositions. My secular colleague is standing on his secular presuppositions. How do we get anywhere? Uh, can't just throw evidence at each other. There's no neutral ground. We can't do that. Um, but we need to recognize that secular presuppositions are sinking sand. They will not support a rational worldview. You can't. You cannot build thinking on the secular worldview because you'd have no reason to trust your senses. You'd have no reason to trust your own thoughts because your brain's just evolution, right? No different than rearranged pond scum, basically. I mean, would you, would you go out to pond scum and think, well, that's going to tell you something about the universe? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's just, it's just an accident of nature. So when that sand dissolves away, the unbeliever is left in a rather awkward position. So what's he going to do? What's the unbeliever going to do? He can't stand on his own worldview because it, it won't make knowledge possible. So what he does is this. Unbelievers will stand on the Christian worldview because they have to. They couldn't make sense of anything apart from the Christian worldview. And we're going to point that out. We're going to point out, wait a minute, sir, with respect, you're standing on Christian ground, right? You're, you're using laws of logic, but those are God's laws of logic. You claim not to be a Christian. And you're using science, but it's only because God upholds the universe in a consistent way that you can do science. And you're saying that certain things are right and wrong, but that only makes sense if Christianity is true. You see, he's standing on Christian ground, stealing Christian principles to support his own worldview. Unbelievers are presuppositional kleptomaniacs. They're constantly stealing from the Christian worldview <laughs> to support their own. They can't help it. He might deny being made in God's image, but he can't escape it. And so he's got to rely on these Christian principles. Of course, he's going to deny that. He's going to say, oh, no, laws of logic, those are not a Christian principle. And we're going to say, oh, yeah, then how do you account for them? How, how do you know about them? How do you know they're constant over time? They're not going to have any answers to that. You could think of the debate over biblical creation a lot like a debate on the existence of air. Can you imagine two people arguing whether or not air exists? Well, it would be strange. What would the critic of air say? He's making all these elaborate arguments. Oh, there's no such thing as air. All the while breathing air and expecting that we can hear his arguments as the sound is transmitted through the air. Wouldn't that be odd? You see, the critic of air must use air in order to make a case against air. The fact that he's able to make his argument proves that his argument is wrong. And it's the same way with biblical creation. The critic of the Bible has to use biblical presuppositions in order to argue against the Bible. The very fact that he can make an argument demonstrates that his argument is wrong. You see, if the Bible weren't true, he wouldn't be able to rely on laws of logic by which he tries to reason against God. He wouldn't be able to rely on science as a legitimate method in order to rant against God. He wouldn't be able to argue that God is a big meanie and immoral and so on because he would have no basis for objective morality apart from the Bible. Isn't that interesting? The secularist is standing on Christian presuppositions while denying that, using Christian presuppositions to try and argue against Christianity. That's not going to go well for him because if he succeeds, he loses, he loses the very ground on which he stands. We were thinking of how to illustrate this, and I kept thinking of those old uh, Wile E. Coyote cartoons where he <laughs> sets a trap and gets caught up in his own trap. That's really the way it is. It really is. Just to drill this home, there's a lot more I could say here, but just consider 
an evolutionist who is outraged at seeing a violent murder on television. He says, I can't believe that man shot that little girl. That's terrible. He should go to jail. Now, I'm glad he's angry, but the, point that, the fact that he's angry shows that in his heart of hearts, he really does know God and that there's an objective standard that murder is objectively wrong because people are made in the image of God, right? You see, his, his, he, this, this is a behavioral inconsistency. On his worldview, the, the worldview that he professes, people are just chemical accidents. So why would you get upset at one chemical accident destroying another chemical accident? You don't get mad at chemistry, right? Chemicals just do what chemicals do. You put the, you know, the vinegar and the baking soda together and it fizzes up, right? You don't say, bad baking soda. You shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Chemi chemicals don't have any choice. If we're just chemistry, there's no choice anyway. Why would you be angry at one chemical getting rid of another chemical? It doesn't make any sense. Or, fr frankly, in the evolutionary view, we're, just, we're evolved animals, right? Animals kill animals. The lion goes out and kills another lion. You don't put the lion in jail and say, you better think about what you did. That was wrong. <laughs> you see, his behavior shows that in his heart of hearts, he really does know God. You know what, he, what he's demonstrated in his anger? He's demonstrated that Romans chapter 1 is true. That people really do have knowledge of God in their hearts. And they, and they show that by the way that they live. Again, a lot more I could say, but... We'd be here for millions of years if I did. <laughs> Here's the key. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's the key. Recognize how all knowledge depends on God. Then you'll be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks a reason of the hope that's in you with gentleness and respect or meekness and fear. That's the key. And, uh, you know, it, it, the more you understand this, the more you're going to be able to see it everywhere. The inconsistency of unbelievers. I think of um, Richard Dawkins, you know, the atheist who goes around teaching how wonderful it is to be an atheist and trying to persuade people that they should be atheists too. I mean, here's a man who is convinced that it's his purpose in life to convince people that there's no purpose in life. Do you see that inconsistency? Once you get that, boy, it's powerful. It's very powerful. And by, and by the way, this is the method that Jesus used in his earthly ministry and why he was able to turn every situation around on his critics. It's very powerful stuff. Now, again, I can't guarantee that people will convert, but that's not your job. Your job is to give a defense. As, as my uh, mentor on this topic liked to put it, Dr. Bonson, he said, it's not our job to open people's hearts. That's up to the Holy Spirit. It's our job to close their mouths. <laughs> and that's what this method does, and it does it effectively. And it's not a trick. It's not a gimmick. It's a way of exposing the truth. That's all it, that's all it does. So if you wanted to use this method to, to try and prove something that's not true, it won't work. It only, it'll only, it's only useful for proving the Christian worldview. That's it. But it does it very effectively. The key is to stand on the authority of God's Word. It doesn't take that long to learn how to do this either. I've been able to teach this to uh, teenagers in a week. And uh, it, it doesn't take that long. That's probably more than just the one 45-minute uh, uh, presentation that you heard today. But uh, it doesn't take long to learn this. And it's, it's astonishing what you'll be able to do. And as you, as you learn this, you'll be able to slice and dice your opponents. It's all the more important to remember the last part of this verse with meekness and fear, with gentleness and respect. Because uh, it's easy to bash people over the head and prove them that they're wrong. That's not why we're here, though. We want people to be one to the Lord, so we need to be gentle and respectful. Because we're, you know, if it weren't for God's grace, we'd be exactly where the unbeliever is. We need to remember that he's made in the image of God, too, even if he denies it. There's some wonderful resources I'd encourage you to get on this topic. We have some of them over here uh, to your right. Uh, the book that I wrote on this topic is called The Ultimate Proof of Creation. And it's going to cover what I covered today and a lot more. And I'll give you examples of how to use this in actual conversations that I've had with uh, secularists on this, on this very issue. Um, a lot of fun. A great resource. I'd encourage you to get that. I know I talk kind of fast, but I wrote the book really slowly so you can take your time with it. Um, how, do I use this to, uh, how do I use this with a Christian, though? Somebody who says, yes, but you're not interpreting Genesis right. Those days might have been millions of years. You don't know how to read the Bible. This is the book that covers that, Understanding Genesis. Discerning truth, how to spot logical fallacies in arguments. Very effective arguments, especially that evolutionists like to make. And so those are some resources I'd encourage you to get. Um, let me see here, I lost my... Oh, Creation Basics and Beyond. Too. This is a great one for college. This will, this will answer all your questions like, was there an ice age? And how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And how did Noah get all the animals on the ark? And, and where did the water for the flood come from? And where did it go? And what about ape men and cavemen and things of that nature? All answered in that book written by our staff scientists uh, at ICR. So that's a great resource as well. And again, I'm not going to go through all of these. Make sure you sign up for Acts and Facts if you haven't already got it. It's free. 
right? Which means it's for you, right? Because I remember when I was a college student, if it's free, it's for me. That was my motto. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I was a college student for what seemed like millions of years. <laughs> check us out on the web as well, icr.org. And if, you can check out my blog, too, if you want to see how to use this method, because I, I dialogue with evolutionists on there. And I want to thank you very much for having me out to speak. I really, really appreciate it.